Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for tuning in to the Galapagos Islands educational tour video. My name is Jack Shaw and I will be your tour guide. This tour will explore a variety of topics and ecosystems in the Galapagos that will help us understand and answer the question of why and how natural selection lead to the outcome of evolution. Let's get started. Before we dive deep into the beautiful and unique ecosystems of the Galapagos Islands, we must talk about the father of evolution and natural selection, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was a naturalist and a geologist who eventually ended up theorizing evolution. Now, I know you're wondering, Jack, this is common knowledge. And besides that point, what does Darwin have anything to do with the Galapagos Islands? Well, I'm glad you asked. Charles Darwin's theories were heavily influenced by the Galapagos Islands, which I will explain to you all throughout this tour. Now, to help you get familiar with our tour, let's travel back in time and put ourselves into the shoes of Charles Darwin. Lace up and prepare yourselves. It's August 1831, and you've just received an outstanding invitation to join the HMS Beagle. Your fascination for nature and your dad's wishes make this offer a no-brainer. You board and join the voyage of the HMS Beagle as the ship's naturalist. The voyage would span the entire globe, leaving the shores of Plymouth, England on December 27th, 1831. And eventually, after four years, reached the Galapagos Islands on September 15th, 1835 on the return route. First landing on the San Cristobal Island, where you stay for eight days and land a whopping five times. Then to Florena for three days, Isabella for two days, and finally, Santiago for two weeks, where we disembark on October 20th, 1835. Now let's travel back in time and untie these shoes, because we'll be going on a different route around the Galapagos Islands. Our first destination will be Santa Cruz, the first of three islands that we'll be visiting. Santa Cruz is the second largest island and the most populated, as it is in the center of the Galapagos. The natural beauty and features of this island is mesmerizing, as the largest accessible lava tunnels, six vegetational zones, white sand beaches, some of the largest mangrove areas, and home to many species of animal, making this a perfect first destination. The animals of Santa Cruz include Galapagos sharks, rays, and tortoises. Now let's focus on the tortoises inhabited in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is home to many wild tortoises that roam freely around the national park lands. While Darwin was on his visit in the Galapagos, he noticed that the tortoises had different traits to adapt to their environments, an important finding that helped him develop his theory of evolution. There are 15 subspecies of tortoises in the Galapagos Islands, the Santa Cruz giant tortoise being one of them, and is the biggest tortoise in the world. There are many, there are main types of Galapagos tortoises, domed, and saddleback. A structural adaptation of the Santa Cruz giant tortoise is its domed shell. Well, the reason why it's domed is because the vegetation and food it eats is close to the ground, making it unnecessary for them to stretch the neck out. A behavioral adaptation of the tortoises is that they like to spend days sitting in a water hole to cool their temperature during the hot seasons of the Galapagos Islands. The giant tortoises have also developed incredibly slow metabolisms which means that they can survive with no food up to a whole year. Quite a unique physiological adaptation. These adaptations help the giant tortoise survive in the Galapagos and its hot weather. Now let's say goodbye to this beautiful island and its animals and sail to our next destination. Next up, Santa Fe. Santa Fe is the oldest island in the Galapagos, roughly 4.5 million years old. The island was the aftermath, aftermath of an uplifting of a layer. This island is unpopulated, and it's the perfect place to wind down. The island of Santa Fe has a very rare formation and a beautiful turquoise lagoon. The island's animals are endemic due to its nature and age. Some of these animals include the sea lion, Santa Fe rice rat, and the Santa Fe land iguana. Santa Fe iguanas are an interesting bunch. Being on a small volcanic island, these small creatures must adapt to the environment in order to survive. So they did just that. A structural adaptation the Santa Fe iguana has is that its skin is paler than other iguanas on the Galapagos. This helps them camouflage and blend in 
into the Santa Fe's landscape, making it harder for predators and prey to spot them. A behavioral adaptation the Santa Fe iguana has is bobbing its head up and down to mark its territory and show aggression against predators. A physiological adaptation iguanas have picked up is regulating its body temperature by basking in the sun. The heat of the sun enters the iguana's body and warms them up. Being on such a small island is not easy for these fellas, but it seems that they've adapted very well to help them survive out there. Last, but definitely not least, we reach our third island, San Cristobal. San Cristobal is the capital of the archipelago and has a population of roughly 7,000. But go easy on the clothing, because this island is the most humid of them all, due to the underground aquifers and fresh water flows. The island is formed by four volcanoes bonded together and holds the largest freshwater lake in the archipelago. Absolutely fascinating. The inhabitants of this island include the frigate bird, red-footed footed booby, and the San Cristobal Mockingbird. Now, let's focus on the San Cristobal Mockingbird. It's a beautiful little bird that's endemic to the island. The, Christ the San Cristobal's Mockingbird's beak, shape and size allow it to feed off small lizards, insects, and plants. This is an example of the Mockingbird's structural adaptation. The San Cristobal Mockingbird have an interesting behavioral adaptation to the climate. The breeding system of the Mockingbirds goes with the time of the year. For example, they breed a lot during El Nino and don't breed at all during droughts. And a cool physiological adaptation of a San Cristobal Mockingbird is being able to mimic and imitate other birds' songs to discourage birds from entering their territory. Cool, right? Now, the San Cristobal Mockingbird isn't just some random species of bird. It's more than that. When Charles Darwin first arrived in the Galapagos, he landed in San Cristobal, where he would find the San Cristobal Mockingbird. He noticed that the different species of mockingbirds were similar to the ones back in mainland South America. But these mockingbirds had various sizes, shapes of their beaks, sizes and shapes of their beaks. This sparked something in Darwin's mind. So he began collecting different species of mockingbirds and finches around the Galapagos, measuring and recording the beak size of each species. Darwin's findings that the beaks of birds change to adapt to the environment, with the favorable adaptations being naturally selected for reproduction, and these advantageous traits, advantageous traits were handed down generation to generation, branching out to make new species. These mockingbirds and finches helped Darwin solidify his idea of evolution through natural selection and he published his book On the Origin of Species on 1859, 24th of November. Now, before we end this tour, let's make a quick stop to the Daphne Island, where we can meet Peter and Rosemary Grant, two lovely scientists that come to Daphne Island every summer since 1973 to learn about the evolution of finches, whilst recording data to back up and prove their findings. When they first arrived, the finches' beaks were small, which were perfect for the environment they were in. They would use their small beaks to eat small seeds and bugs. But in 1977, a devastating drought had hit the island of Daphne. There was no rain for 18 months, and the medium ground finches became competing for food. The small seeds were scarce, so they had to turn to large seeds, where the small seed beaks finches struggled to break open and eat. Uh-oh. The Grants had come to find out that 80% of the medium ground finches died, but had noticed something peculiar. There was a trend in their findings. This graph, drawn out by the scientists, showed that the surviving finches, highlighted in black, were predominant in the bigger beaked category. In other words, the larger the beak, the higher the likelihood of surviving the 1977 drought. Now, when Grants measured and recorded the beak sizes of the 1976 parents' offsprings, they found that the beak size of the average finch had increased by 4% than the previous generation, thus proving that natural selection had changed the average beak size and as a result, evolution has occurred. Some other patterns and trends we can find after analyzing the data the Grants have accumulated is that male finches are bigger than female finches and that although the beak depth of surviving birds are 0.56 millimeters more than the mean de beak depth of the non-surviving birds, the standard deviation of the two graphs are quite similar, which means that the distribution of the graph had only shifted and the variation stays the same. 
To conclude this tour, let's take a look back at our focus question. Why and how does natural selection lead to the outcome of the evolution? Thanks to our visit to the beautiful islands of the Galapagos and the ecosystems, Darwin's discovery, we can conclude that the finches stemmed from one single population. But after arriving at the Galapagos and its different islands, the birds had faced new conditions and adapted to their environments. Thus, the traits of these finches changed, and ones with advantageous traits reproduced and evolved, becoming distinct species. This is also evident and proved by the Grant's finch study. Looks like that's the end of our tour, and we hope to see you another time. Thank you for tuning in to the Galapagos Islands tour. Goodbye!